Welcome to Sardar TV, an idea sharing platform founded by Russell Sardar, who's an author, investor, and the CEO of Netcom Learning. We're thrilled to have Fred Reichheld join us today. Fred is the creator of the Net Promoter System and the author of a new book called Winning on Purpose, and he's here to tell us more. Fred, thank you so much for joining us today. It's a pleasure to have you here. My pleasure. You're the inventor of the Net Promoter System. Tell us a little bit about your, your background and your career journey and some of the professional roles that you're playing today. Well, I grew up in a uh, suburb of Cleveland, Ohio called Parma. Was, was lucky enough to get accepted at Harvard College. And I'm, I'm guessing I was probably the first kid from Parma High School to ever have that experience. I uh, graduated, met my wife. I was bartending and she was a waitress. Uh, we we're waiting to figure out what our long-term jobs will be. And that was 45, 44 years ago, a long time ago. And uh, I joined Bain shortly thereafter, um, between years in business school. Been at Bain say, 45 years, let's say. And um, early in that career, I started seeing companies that I admired that were earning unusual levels of growth and prosperity. They were treating their customers right, their employees right. And I, I just could not figure out, according to the existing laws of strategy and economics that I'd learned, how to explain it. And, and suddenly it, it became clear that these companies were earning loyalty. They were inspiring their teams of employees to treat customers the way you'd want a loved one treated. And, and that, that, that idea that when you treat customers right, the way you treat a loved one, they feel the love, they come back for more and bring their friends. And that, that little um, flywheel is what drives success. And I originally thought it was just in a niche of you know, certain businesses. I saw Enterprise Rent-A-Car have this success story and, and a few others in financial services. But over the years, I've seen that that drives success in almost every industry. And the shocking thing is, as is, is clear as it is to me, it is invisible to most of the world because they see the world through accounting lenses. You know, you use accounting gap financials as your record of progress and success. And that framework completely ignores that idea of love that the customers are, feel and inspires them to come back for more and bring their friends. So Net Promoter was an, a metric I invented to make this flywheel to illuminate it and make it the center of business management and uh, and we've made a little progress but boy there's a long way to go tell us why you decided to write this book winning on purpose now yeah the most recent book i wrote uh i think largely because i saw so many people using net promoter score uh, fortune magazine last year said their estimate was two-thirds of the large of the fortune 1000 use nps and I'm thrilled in some ways, but I'm, I'm just uh, so sad in others because so many people misuse it and, uh, and some abuse it. The, the philosophy of love thy neighbor as thyself is sort of a moral code that is the foundation of NPS is getting completely ignored by companies who are just installing it as a KPI and holding people accountable to it. And so you get gaming and manipulation and, oh, let's report it to, to our, uh, to the investors. Cause look, we, what, we got a high score, but they have no idea how to measure it rigorously. So my winning on purpose is trying to get the net promoter movement back on track. So tell us about um, how this book differs from the, you know, other book that you wrote um, years ago. Well, I started 30-ish years ago writing about the microeconomics of loyalty. The loyalty effect laid out customer lifetime value appropriately taking into account the powerful economic advantage of uh, loyal customers who come back for more and bring their friends. And that microeconomics focus evolved into leadership issues and then the invention of the net promoter score because, well, it, you know, the, the reality of have you treated a customer so well that they've become a promoter, you'll know by their behaviors that they, they do come back, they buy more stuff, they say good things about you, they, um, they, they aren't as price sensitive, they treat your employees with dignity and respect. These, these are the behaviors, but it's really hard to measure in real time and make part of your management system and have your daily priorities set. So I saw the need for a, a timely, 
you know, a way to put a dipstick into a relationship and know almost instantly, are we on track or off track? And, and so Net Promoter, I, I introduced in a book called The Ultimate Question. It was a theory. There were only two or three companies using this. Then thousands started using it. it so the next book was now that it's, it's a practice and a, and a system, The Ultimate Question 2.0 laid out the best practices. But as I say, even though that book was pretty clear, it wasn't clear enough because most people don't get it. And, and I thought, I'd better get back to this notion of purpose. Winning on purpose is making a, a pretty radical argument. It says that there is only one way to succeed in business, and that is to love your customers, to, to inspire, if you're a leader, to inspire your teams, to treat your customers like loved ones, and then let them sh hear the standing ovations and, the, and feel the love back. But that's just not how businesses run today, and I hope Winning on Purpose helps uh, helps correct that. Did you ever envision that the system and would be used the way it is today and as as broadly as it is? No, I mean, heavens. The number of people that have been touched by Net Promoter, it's probably more than have been touched by COVID. You know, the, it's, it's just spread around the world in this unpredictably crazy, I mean, good, generally good way. Um, but then misusing it and finding a way to take a, a really good idea with love at its core and turn it into a, an abusive, ma ma well, to, to bring it to life, you go buy a car at a dealer and they use this net promoter score, but they use it the wrong way and they, they rank order their salesmen based on net promoter score and they get them in trouble or, you know, the bottom quartile. So you start seeing dealer salespeople just begging and pleading for scores. Uh, it's sort of like the Uber driver who says, you know, you got to give me a five or I'll lose my job. Well, I don't want to give feedback that's going to lose your job, but you know, the app didn't work. <laughs> How do I get that feedback through? And this abuse of the system by linking it to, to frontline bonuses and career options, it you know, it's destroyed its effectiveness. So let's step back for a second and educate our viewers who might not be familiar with your system. And so tell us, what is the Net Promoter System and how does it work? We were searching for a single question that could get to the core of uh, the health of a relationship. And we tried how satisfied you are, you know, are you, how likely to return, all the usual suspects, many of which have been combined in complex uh, indices and black box metrics that people sell. Uh, and I, I wanted an open source, transparent system. If we're going to have one question, what's the single question that gets to the core of the issue? We found it was, how likely would you be to recommend this to a friend? That predicted these behaviors of coming back for more, bringing your friends, treating, treating employees with respect. So that one question predicts the future so well. And so you just ask on a, on a scale from zero to 10, how likely would you be to recommend us to a friend? And then why? It, so that open text verbatim lets the customer tell you in their own words, what was important that made them feel the way they do. And then my daughter, Jenny, sort of upped the ante. She said, dad, you need a third question. It, it's especially for the promoters who give you a, a nine or a 10. The next question for, for her is, is there anything else we could have done to make your experience even better? But those, those three questions, a score and a couple of open text verbatims are the essence of the system. The score itself just takes the number of people who give you a nine or a 10 and they're promoters. They, you know, they, they felt the love. They want you to succeed. Their life has been enriched. Minus the detractors, which are the zeros through sixes. Mm -hmm. So pro detractors, zero through six, seven and eight passives you know they got what they paid for but they're not assets you didn't enrich their life you got they you know you, they paid for what they got and then these assets the promoters now some people have fixated on oh it's a survey based thing well you know we started with a survey but that's not the core the, the real issue is breaking the world of outcomes into did you create a promoter or did you fail when you touched a life did you enrich it or did you uh, diminish it and it's the, the real essence of the system is knowing that that success and failure and keeping track of it in your daily business. And, and more and more companies are minimizing the surveys. <laughs> more need to minimize it. There are too many surveys. Mm -hmm. And they're just looking at signals. You know, you can look at click throughs and purchase patterns on digital interactions. And that tells you whether you've got a promoter or not. But then you still need questions two and three. Why and what could we do better?
and and that's the future of the system it's just more digital observation a little less surveying thank you give us an example of uh, a company that has applied the system successfully well one of the earliest adopters was uh, apple apple retail stores have used net promoter to to ping a, uh, a sample of customers who come into the store each day, ask that simple short survey and get feedback, and then close the loop. Anyone who gives a score of zero through six, they're gonna get a phone call, not, not from some staffy at in Cupertino headquarters, but from a leader in the store apologizing and probing for the root cause and trying to fix it. And then bringing that story to the opening huddle so that everyone who works in the store is starting their day understanding what went wrong yesterday and when you they got nines and tens with great verbatim comments they have shout outs and kudos for the team members who earned them and also and everyone hears that and you know i think good people want to earn standing ovations they want to feel the love so the system is just really bringing to life how well they're doing at their mission which is to enrich the lives of their customers and that that simple system has been brilliant. Now they've fine-tuned it. I think they're in release 5.0, but they're the ones that started using love uh, in, in the language. When they released one of their, uh, it was a few years ago, but it was on Valentine's Day, the upgrade of the Net Promoter System in Apple, uh, the lady who runs it said, this system is designed to help our teams feel the love from their customers. And that is the right goal. So a Apple's one of many who are using it right. This question, how likely are you to recommend your service or product to yeah. a friend? What is it truly measuring then? You talk about love, you talk about the customer, the heart of it. What is it truly yeah. measuring? I've learned a lot. You know, I, I said originally we used a scientifically rigorous process to say which question actually predicts customer behaviors that are in that really would be proof that you have made their life better why does wood recommend do such a good job i've learned over the years because a recommendation itself is an act of love when you feel that your life has been enriched by someone you recommend that to a friend because you want that for a loved one you want that enriching experience for someone you care about a friend or family member and and so the love standard is what recommendation and referral uncovers. And, and then I've had executives say, well, Fred, you know, you wouldn't recommend to a friend if this was a, a, you know, a company that abuses its employees or that pollutes the environment. You, you have to be proud of the association, not just what they've done for you personally, in enriching your life, but they've done it in a way that you think is sustainable and we would be good for the people you care about, your friends and relatives. So they've explained to me that this is the best ESG metric they've ever found because you can't love a carbon footprint. What you love is the customer feeling so good about what this company or this brand or this team is doing for you in the world that, that they, you know, they, they give it a 10 and, and, and recommend. It's not as short an answer as you expected, I'm sure, but this, I, this idea of getting at the core of, have they felt the love? A referral is right there at the center of it. Give us some uh, examples of companies who s consistently score high on NPS. There's a big NPS and a little NPS. Little NPS is the, the survey, zero through 10, how likely you'd recommend. That helps you get at the truth. Big NPS is the truth. It's this notion of, putting customers first as your primary mission, earning high scores from your customers. Uh, and I, who's, who's great at this? Well, at Bain, we measure uh, dozens and dozens of industries now uh, carefully. Who has the highest net promoter score uh, in retailing? It would be uh, Costco and uh, Aldi is pretty darn good. There's a, a regional grocer down in Texas called HEB. Those are the Amazon is really quite strong. Chewy in the uh, online pet uh, supply sales, even better than Amazon. Uh, Apple, I mentioned, Apple is a superstar in net promoter scores. It, Discover Card uh, in, in the US financial services has actually gone past American Express, who was always the long, long time NPS champion. 
And the interesting thing is these companies, when I find someone who's got the highest NPS in their industry, it says this is special. Um, I mean, for, I like to study them, write about them, make their successes more public because I want the world to see business success in the same way that I do, enriching the lives of customers and employees. And so these superstars are the, they're the show dogs that I want people to see and understand. And what was cool for this last book, Winning on Purpose, once we identified these NPS leaders in each industry, we went back and looked at the total shareholder return of investors for those that would public companies. And sure enough, they have the highest total shareholder return in their industry. So it's not like this is some moral philosophy for flakes. This is actually, it links to the core economic realities of sustainable business. And, and it's why I think Net Promoter is such a, a special idea. It's, it's, it's more than just a metric. It's a philosophy of life. Tell us what the research has shown about how organizations really view customers as a priority. Well, people who put customers first um, are a special breed. It turns out that only 10% of businesses today would say that the primary reason they exist is to make customers' lives better. It was shocked me. I, I just took for granted that um, the only way to succeed was to treat your customers so they come back for more and bring their friends. It just, it's so common sense. I think every small business person understands that. But somehow as you grow a business and become a complex global organization, you stop seeing common sense and you start seeing accounting numbers and KPIs that bosses are putting up there and you think that's the reality and you forget about the common sense that underlies what I think most businesses are trying to, to do. And, and so most companies, when you ask them, what's your primary purpose? They'll say, maximize shareholder value, maximize profits, maybe be a great place to work. Maybe the most common one today is the politically correct, oh, we wanna be good to all of our stakeholders. But, but these purposes are empty and, and they, they are guaranteed to lose. The only companies who seem to be able to sustainably deliver great results for all stakeholders are the ones who say, they're not all equal. We exist for customers. But this is what Costco says very clearly. This is what Apple says. All of these winners, it's not just luck. They have defined the purpose of their organization in a way that has helped them win. So tell us what it is, what can some you know, larger organizations, like you said, who might be focusing on other, other things aside from the customer, learn from smaller businesses who have gotten it right? Well, I think everybody is struggling to grow sustainably and profitably. And um, when you look through the light that NPS shines on an industry, you'll see who's growing profitably. It's because they're creating a lot of promoters. And instead of looking at cost per new customer, you start looking at cost per new customer who becomes a promoter. And it reorients your sales and marketing. It reorients what you think of as the core economics of your business. And what I hope people will understand with this last book, Winning on Purpose, is we need to get a better handle on the, uh, the, re the referral and recommendation, not just the survey, would you, probabilistic stuff. We need to get control of this flow of referral and recommendation so we can measure and monitor and, and improve it. Because that's, you know, that's where the love is. That, that's, that's where the future is for, for uh, customer-centered businesses. So we've touched upon this, the, the idea of the net promoter really being about love and care and commitment to your customers. And you also said, you know, there's a lot of organizations that really don't put customers as a priority or don't view them in, in, in the data. What are some things that organizations can do to start making it so that their customers are, are that priority? Well, if I were a leadership team that were serious about driving my culture in the direction of customer focus, I would, uh, I would uh, get some feedback from my employees and ask them, what is it uh, we're doing that is uh, getting in your way of treating customers the way you'd want to treat a loved one? And I would listen carefully and not just do this once, but I'd, I'd, you know, I'd find the top issues, talk about them, figure out what, uh, how to solve those. And once you think they're solved, ask people again what now is at the top of the list instead of just using kpis and uh and and financial targets to run and control your business get votes from your people 
on what has to change. And then also, also, what are we doing that is great, that makes you proud? Who is doing thing? Who, who's doing things in your team that deserve to be recognized as uh, as best practice? And get that flow of information into uh, weekly huddles that that really drive the conversation and set the priorities. Otherwise, you're really you're defaulting to what the accountants came up with. And accountants measure stuff that's important. You know, for it's sustainable. You can't live without a, a healthy economic business, but that's not what drives it. When you measure, when your governance systems are based on accounting numbers, your bonuses are paid, your progress is measured, your daily priorities, you allocate capital, you know, all these decisions on accounting numbers. Remember, accounting numbers ignore this flywheel of customer love coming back for more and bringing their friends. And you have to find a way to refocus people to when we're winning and losing. When are we enriching a life? When are we diminishing a life? And then what do we need to change to do a better job? And those that just does not exist in most companies today. So given that financial, the financial measures are equally important for organizations, how does the net promoter system help support those financials and the accounting around the success? that you're, we're looking for with the net promoter system and the love and the care and the commitment to our customers? The, uh, the sharpest uh, chief financial officers that I know are central to this. And they do things like quantify the lifetime value of a customer who does, uh, who is a promoter, who, who not just gives a score as of, of a 10 and a verbatim comment, but they're, they're behaving like promoters. And they, They'll find that promoters are worth, you know, five times, ten times as much as a, uh, a cust that the other customers, and they start to show what it's worth to enrich a life. And then you can get some basic math about what you can afford to invest to enrich that life. There's a maybe a, a story would help here. I Discover Card I mentioned earlier is the the leader in NPS in the credit card business, and. Uh, I asked one of the uh, senior executives, what's different here? What what made you so go right past American Express, who had been the longtime leader in NPS to the top of the charts? She said, well, Fred, I've worked, I've worked in several really uh, big, sophisticated financial companies. And I have, she was a consultant before that, so she had seen lots of different industries. She said, what's, what's rare here um, is the way we do our priority setting. She said, for example, in our capital allocation, you know, every, every company I know sits down and has a budgeting process and everyone has their project uh, as, as a candidate to get funded for, for the next year or the next quarter. She said, what I'd always seen was whoever had the, the, the highest return on investment, that was how we rank ordered. You know, it's a financial mindset. Hit discover, we don't do that. We look at who has the, the most important customer problems that they can solve. And they rank order what's important to invest in based on the severity of the customer problems that need to be solved. And the ones at the top of the list, then they figure out a way to make that affordable. So they think of profits as a constraint, not the objective. The objective is maximizing happy customers whose problems have been solved. And that's a I mean, that's a very, very important shift that companies need to make. You also mentioned that you've seen the system being misused in ways, being tied to KPIs and bonuses and things like that. Can you tell us a little bit more about what you've seen? Yeah, when, when companies obsess on the score, if they, they sort of, you know, NPS was originally Net Promoter Score, now, now I, I, when I say it, it usually means net promoter system, but the score is very valuable as a learning tool, but the instant you turn it into a target where people are, you know, their bonus is based on it, so they actually care about the score more than what they can learn from the score and the verbatim explanations they get from customers. Then you get things like, oh, we don't send surveys in the insurance business to people whose claim has been denied. <laughs> so, but what does that mean? It means... They're not learning from an important category of customer who's, who's really unhappy. And why do they make that choice? Because they want their scores to go up because that's what their bonus is on. Or you get the car dealer behavior of begging and pleading for a score. There are so many ways that you can 
bias the score upwards because surveys are tricky you know sampling strategies and response rates and you know if you want a higher score just come to me and i could make your score go up by 10 points just just by switching how likely you'd recommend to a friend 10 to 0 as opposed to 0 to 10 that you know those are silly things and if they're used inappropriately they lead to people losing confidence in nps more broadly when in fact it's just gaming and manipulation that you could have done with your profit numbers but you go to jail we don't have people being as serious about getting this metric done right and, and eventually I, I had to invent a separate metric so we could have a hard metric as well as this softer survey based metric so tell us more about that well the the need for a new metric became clear when i was preaching to the companies using NPS, stop linking it to frontline bonuses. Stop shaming people by having individual scores. You know, Apple does, ne never does that. Apple's scores uh, for each individual go to the individual. The boss in the chain of command also has access to see what's going on, but none of the peers are there because they, they recognize it's hard to learn. When you get a low score from a customer, that hurts. And so you have to get some safe space to think about it. And, and process it and figure out how to get better. The instant you make it a public humiliation, you destroy the love. And But I couldn't, you know, I've, I've failed this far to convince many people to back off this KPI application. So I saw we needed a different score that together with Net Promoter could help accomplish this goal of loving your customers better. And uh, I, I discovered it being used at a bank called First Republic. Um, First Republic is a very impressive success story. I, I think too few people know about it. it I think they raised $8 million to, of seed funding to get this going 30 years ago or whenever it was, maybe longer. And now they're worth uh, $35, $40 billion. It's a monstrous financial success. But they've done it the right way, just like Apple has done it, like Enterprise Rent-A-Car, like Costco. They really have focused on treating their customers right so they come back for more and bring their friends. And they measure it. Uh, I, I was there, a keynote speaker for them uh, a few years ago. And in, uh, in prepping me for this, uh, this talk, they showed me some investor slides that they sh use each, each uh, investor day. And I saw one that said, uh, you know, we're, our loans are growing at 15% a year, even though the market is growing at 2% a year. And in my conversation, I learned that, you know, when you're, a, when you're in a risk business, whether it's insurance or banking, when you're growing faster than the market, investors and regulators look at you and think, ooh, you must be loosening your credit standards. You're, you're just a, uh, a loan loss disaster waiting to happen. And, and First, Republic, First, First Republic knew that wasn't true because they are, most of their growth is with existing customers who they know even better and with the new customers that are indeed riskier, they're the people who were referred. And so they measure of all the new business that comes in, how much is coming from existing customers buying more and their referrals. And it was almost 90%. And I thought, oh my gosh, when your earned growth rate is 90% of your growth rate, you've got quality sustainable growth. And, and as I thought about it, I said, we, this is something every company should be quantifying and eventually reporting. But initially, just get the data everyone sort of talks about referrals and recommendation as if it's really important and our reputation is everything it's even in the bible but do we measure it no we don't have it and then i said well look at first republic they measure it every new customer that comes in they ask them what's the primary reason you joined and if it's a referral they figure out who and why and and what to do about that now it's going to be a different challenge in different industries but this is not you don't need a genius to figure this one out. It's just going to take some hard work and some some reasonable 80-20 thinking. Get you know 80-20 being get the the core of the insight, even though it's not perfect. But get that into your learning process as opposed to saying, "Oh, I don't know how to do it." <laughs> Tell us more about leadership's role in the Net Promoter system in organizations. It's everything. I I used to think you could take any organization and just sort of change it from the bottom, but I don't believe that's right. I think leaders are the ones who, it, it is their set of priorities. When, when, when they think the primary purpose of their organization is to enrich the lives of customers, great things can happen. If leaders believe that 
well, we want our people to be more, more customer focused uh, so I can make more money and make my investors rich. You're not going to have a very impressive, sustainable run. And, and so I've come to recognize I personally only want to work with companies who are led by uh, people who have those values. And frankly, those are the only kind of companies I want my kids to work for. Those are the only kind of companies I want to buy from. And, and as we learned, they're the only companies you want to invest in because that is the set of companies who are crushing the stock market. Although it's invisible, you know, if people read Winning on Purpose, especially Chapter 5, I just can't imagine they're going to see the world the same way anymore. Tell us more about how these companies have outperformed the, the stock market and how much of, you know, NPS we can maybe attribute to that. Well, NPS wasn't necessarily at the core of why these companies have succeeded, although for many it was. They, they were early adopters of little NPS in the system. They thought that fit their, their value system and, and they could learn more at rapidly. But the, the investment insight was when you pick the companies that have the highest NPS in their industry, try investing in them. And, and when we, we had a, a list from my previous book, I wrote with Rob Markey, a book called The Ultimate Question 2.0, we listed all of the companies that, that were the best in their industry, ranked on NPS. Of, I'd say almost half of those were private, but the half who were public companies, I personally invested my money in those stocks 10 years ago. Over the last 10 years, those stocks have tripled the stock market. And I continue to improve because we, we measure NPS at Bain. And if we take a new industry and have a new leader, I invest in that company and that stock index, I call it the Fredzy. It's, I mean, I'm Fred, but it's also foster recommendation, eliminate detraction. So at SI stock index, the Fredzy, it's a powerful way to invest your money and you don't need any financial analysis because in my mind, most of the financial metrics have been absorbed into the pricing of the market. What the market is missing is this idea that only sustainable growth comes from customers coming back for more and bringing their friends. And NPS, relative to competitors, shines the light on who's got that flywheel humming better than anyone else. And so to date, I have not gotten calls from hedge funds. I'm astonished. But, you know, I, I, I've made enough money in life. <laughs> I'm a very happy man. Um, but I also think investors can pressure companies to see the world the right way and set the right objectives. So I'm hoping we'll get a little bit more interest there. Talk a little bit about the frontline employees role in, in NPS and how they can support it within an organization. Yeah, I've found that the leaders who really do put customers first recognize that they have to inspire their frontline teams, everyone in the organization, but especially frontline teams to treat customers right. To, to treat them like loved ones. And when they can't, because of some constraint of a policy or a procedure or a lack of tools, they have to put pressure back upward to their to the executives to fix it. And so list, they, executives in these companies listen carefully to their frontline teams. Um, and, you know, it's hard work and, and it's not all roses there, but when there's something that is stopping them from delighting customers, these executives fix it. I'll go back to Discover for an example. Their C-suite listens in on phone conversations of their customer service reps dealing with customers every day and observe the, uh, the online interactions and read them. So for two hours every month, they're listening and observing, um, and not just a random mix of things. That It's the people who run the call centers curate the group of calls and communications that they think are important for the, to the senior guy people to, to understand. But then after they, they, they learn from that, they sit as a team and they, they talk about how we have to change our priorities and which investments we have to make to, to get a system that helps solve the problem that's getting in the way of our teams earning customer love. And that closing loop between frontline teams and what executives are doing with their investments and priorities inspires frontline teams. They know their life makes a difference. They don't think, oh, I'm going to get automated away. You know, we're going to go digital and they're going to fire me. Uh, I think there's a deal at, at Discover, for instance, we don't lay people off. When they come up with an idea to, to make something go digital, 
we share the benefit with them that this is a this is a team sport and i and i think every company is has got to really embrace get the hearts and the minds of their people into this uh mindset of our goal is to enrich the lives we touch that is what makes the world a better place that's what makes our lives better and we need to measure we need to have tools to measure progress toward that and talk about it and and that's essentially what the net promoter system is trying to provide so tell us about your philosophy that centers around all the great leaders that you've seen the net promoter manifesto the first draft of winning on purpose had the leadership the uh, the manifesto at the beginning because so much of this notion of uh, loving customers has to come from the heart of leaders and and it it makes them pretty it's a bold manifesto it, i think it's every bit as radical as the communist manifesto in in its way because it says the job of a leader a great leader helps their teams lead great lives and and that begs the question well what's a great life well i think it's a life of service to others that is so meaningful that it enriches their lives and and it shows that this chain of, of it starts with a leader who's committed to make their people uh, to give their people opportunities to lead lives of meaning and purpose to have careers that actually make a difference and make the world better and and, and so their interests are perfectly aligned when you have a leader who feels like their job is to help you lead a great life that's a pretty cool thing and then they measure and help you know if you are leading a great life by giving feedback from the customers who you're supposed to serve. And are you earning nines and tens standing ovations? Are they feeling the love? That is not how most companies run today. But I think it's how, it's certainly the companies that I wanna be a part of, invest in, buy from. And those are the companies that truly make the world better. Now, there's so much you know, we're all afraid of climate change, and there's a lot of attention with ESG metrics, and I guess appropriately, but seriously. Do you love a carbon footprint? Is, is that the thing that energizes? No, it, you, want your cust you want to serve customers so well they recommend you and recognize that, you know, if your customers know that you're abusing your people or, or polluting the environment or behaving in a, in a, a way that's hurting your society, that it gets reflected in how customers give you that feedback. And I think that's where ESG can be a, approached in a very practical way. We don't need a lot of new metrics, to be honest. You know, now that you need some, but you basically need to convince your customers that you're doing the right thing. How do you do that? Not through PR campaigns. You convince your employees who have a little bit of, of an inside track on knowing the truth so if you want to convince someone that you're making the, the world better and the environment better, make sure your employees understand that and, and believe it and care about it. And, and then it goes down to the customers. Too many people today think, oh, I can come up with a metric and I'll show my investors how good I am and put lipstick on the pig and, you know, I've got my problem solved. Tell us where NPS is going. What's sort of the next phase? What are you going to do next and why? It's a great question. I ask myself every day. Um, I am going to try and do a number of things. One is get investors, more investors to join my team and, and act on these insights. Probably more important, I'm committed to helping develop tools and techniques to identify referral and recommendation driven new business and, uh, quantify that and help people understand the economics of it. And I suppose the, the, the final one is this, it's in this radical manifesto. It's to, it's to convince people that a good business makes people's lives better. When in fact, I think capitalism has earned a pretty bad reputation from many people in the world. It's, it's, it's thought of as maximizing shareholder value and extracting value from people who are vulnerable. Um, that's not that's not today's winners. Today's winners are these NPS leaders who are treating people with love. And I want more of the world to see the facts here and put more pressure on the guys who are doing a crappy job that, that are giving all of us a bad name. You've had an amazing career, uh, 45 years, written several books. You have this amazing system behind you. Tell us some of the greatest career advice 
that you've received over the years? Let's see. Great career advice. Well, you got to do what you love um, because at some point, that's the only thing that keeps you going. Um, if, if, especially if you're sort of lucky and talented, you can make as much money as you want. Um, you don't need more money. So why would you bother getting up and going to work and, and doing the hard things that need to be done to change the world? You have to feel that, you know, it, you have to be inspired by, by work that uh, lets you energize yourself. And I know that's sort of theoretical, impractical to most people, but I know your, your program is for senior executives. And my guess is most of you are good enough to, to make plenty of money and, and retire and ride private jets when you need to. That isn't what keeps most good people energized in, when they're in their 70s and 80s. Um, I just had my 70th birthday. I am still fired up by what, uh, what I'm committed to doing. Another piece of career advice? Um, you know, hire, have people around you who share your values. Um, if you're a leader who thinks that the golden rule, love thy neighbor as thyself, is really the center of good uh, human relationships, the only way you're going to build that into your organization is by, uh, by hiring and promoting uh, like-minded leaders. And so you, you have to have a way of getting to that truth and reinforcing it. The, I use a practical example at Bain that I think is brilliant, that we, we have our teams uh, evaluate their leaders. And those evaluations don't decide who gets promoted, but they do decide who's eligible to get promoted. And so if you have the teams who see behavior in the trenches, you know, in the, with all the stress, they know who follows the golden rule and, and, uh, and also has the skills to, to help the team win. You have to give them a, a reliable, safe way to comment on that and not just as a way to help coach leaders to be better but i don't i think it's also got to have the hard rule i i don't want people leading i don't want people in positions of power and authority in my organization especially if i'm global and i don't know everyone anymore i have to rely on a a systematized voice and vote from my teams that that gets the right people into into these positions and and maybe for big businesses, that's the most important advice you can have. That's great advice. Thank you so much, Fred. My pleasure. So this was really great. We really enjoyed it. You gave us some wonderful insight. I'm sure our viewers are going to benefit immensely. So appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. And if more people read Winning on Purpose with a serious intent, uh, the world will be a better place. It will be. I agree. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. And we'll see you next time on Sartor TV.